Good afternoon. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, you know, I speak in a lot of different places, and, uh, you know, sometimes you can have nerves. And in hearing some of the speakers today, I'm very nervous speaking before this crowd because I want to make sure that you guys walk out of here like, what was that guy talking about? The, the only other time I was this nervous, I actually spoke at the uh, climate talks in Cancun. And uh, I was the only member, I was a USDOT representative, I was presenting on this concept of livability around energy and, and global and climate change. And uh, the State Department had sat me down and they were like, uh, you know, you can't say this and whatever you do, don't do this. And, and for God's sake, whatever you do, it, it felt like that old, uh, I felt like uh, whatever you do, don't mention the war, right? Uh, from uh, Faulty Towers. And uh, so I get up there, I'm very nervous, and I just go to start presenting, and I point up to my presentation, which they said was being simulcast in a bunch of places, and up on the thing it said, uh, the impact of sidewalks on Budapest climate uh, impacts. And I was like, you told me all these things that I couldn't get wrong, you had one job, and you messed it up. So the one thing I remember from that presentation is that 30% of uh, 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 climate change gases come from the US transportation sector. So for us, uh, energy, climate change, these are all big deals. I heard one of the speakers earlier talk about how the, um, uh, the focus is on renewables and things like that. I think our future five years from now, 10 years from now, how many people here, and I can, I can sort of see, how many people have heard of self-driving cars? Anybody here have a, anybody here have a Tesla? A self-driving Tesla? My, my 2009 Honda Accord doesn't have many of these self-driving features either, but they're coming. And they're coming quickly. In fact, last year we had a big summit uh, in, uh, in Denver, and they brought this $130,000 self-driving BMW, which I thought was an oxymoron, right? It's a self-driving BMW. Why do you buy a, a self-driving BMW? But this is coming. So just from a, from a, from a transportation uh, energy nexus, I feel like we get treated like many utilities do, right? Like people think of transportation the same way they think of electricity, right? You flick the switch and it just turns on, right? And it's only a crisis when you flick the switch and it doesn't come on. Well, in transportation, people expect, right? I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna drive, and the road's gonna be there, right? So CDOT, we have uh, 3,500 bridges, 6.1 million miles plowed a year, 35 mountain passes. I was the secretary in Delaware before I went to Colorado. People ask me what's the biggest difference. In Delaware, slope is anything that water will flow down, right? Uh, we did not have mountain passes there, and we have a $1.5 billion budget. Uh, I'll skip over a couple of these because I realize that we're getting close to happy hour, uh, and, I, and I don't want to do that, but, oh, there we go. But our, our, our summit, our goal is to be the best department of transportation in the country, and technology, we have three peaks, technology, people, and system. Technology, I feel, is actually going to be uh, the biggest uh, disruptor uh, in, in the next few years. Uh, the, the last speaker, Doyle, I think his name was, he talked about it's safe to be in the water, right? And that it's okay to be out there. We're, I'm a state government employee, right? Uh, I've been a political appointee at the federal level, at the state level. You never want to be the lone gazelle down by the water, right? You never want to be the first person, you know, what a great idea until something goes wrong because then bad things happen to your public service uh, career. But this is a time of change. It's exciting stuff that's going on. And, sorry, uh, a buddy of mine who lives in Austin, uh, I asked him, because I have to go to the airport after this, I asked him, What's a, when is traffic bad in Austin? He's like, pretty much all the time, right? He's like, pretty much between 2 and 7 is a bad time, right? Well, we have that kind of traffic in Denver. I actually felt like Denver had made it to the big leagues uh, recently because we got listed in like some you know, men's health magazine or like top 10 worst roads in America, right? The I-5, you know, the 405 in LA, uh, a bunch of roads here in Texas, and then here's Denver, right? And I tell people, if you think it's bad now, right, uh, we're gonna have 50% more people in Colorado in the next 20 years. Uh, they're gonna have 50% more vehicle miles traveled, and that means that you know, your average traffic time, and I think Austin and Denver, Nashville, some of these high growth areas are the same sort of an issue. Um, you're gonna have two to three times more peak traffic. And you say, well, what's the energy nexus here? Well, all those cars are sitting in traffic and idling, right? They're idling in traffic, they're throwing off, uh, you know, uh, uh, emissions. So we've launched this program called RoadX. So RoadX for us is all about, you know, the, the public sector, right? We're not 
there's certain things that we do well. State governments, right? We, we plow the roads well. We should plow the roads well, right? Or we spawn, respond in, in storm events, right? And we're good at regulating uh, certain things. And we're, there's certain road functions that we're very good at. One of the things that we're not great at, that the private sector is very good at, is innovation, right? New ideas. There's a profit motive in the, in the private sector that does not exist in the public sector, and that's great. And so what Road X is, is this idea that there are all kinds of great ideas out there around uh, technology, self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, safety is our number one priority. The Federal Highway Administration estimates that 80% of crashes can be eliminated uh, through connected vehicle technologies, right? So in, in Colorado last year, we lost 540 people on our roadways. That's 500 deaths that don't occur because of connected vehicle technologies. We lost 33,000 Americans on our roadways last year, dead, right? That's the size of a, of a good-sized town, right? That doesn't count all the serious injuries and crashes uh, or serious injuries that resulted uh, from crashes. And so if you think about that, if we can take care of that, there is, a, there is a real issue there. So connected vehicles, big data, everybody talks about big data. I saw uh, parabytes or petabytes, right? I remember selling computers when it was, uh, you could buy a, a hard drive with 60 gigabytes. That was, the, uh, that was the big amount. Well, there's a huge amount out there now. Uh, advanced trucking, right? Trucking and freight generate huge amounts of uh, greenhouse gas, gas emissions. Well, there's a, there's a thing. Has anybody heard of truck platooning? Anybody here a NASCAR fan? Any NASCAR fans here? Uh, it's, a, it's a niche. It's getting smaller. But uh, uh, if you saw the movie uh, Days of Thunder, right? Tom Cruise, he always wants to put his NASCAR right behind the one in front because there's a huge aerodynamic benefit, right? So if we get these truck platoons of 10 trucks going down and the first truck is here and right now there's six car lengths and the next truck and the next truck it takes up this much space, Right? But if I, have those, uh, if I have computers controlling those trucks, they can be inches off the one in front of them. And that's about a 20% increase uh, in aerodynamic efficiency, which means a 20% reduction in fuel usage. That's a big deal, right? We're also talking about electrification of these fleets. We're also talking about natural gas. So there's this, there's this huge nexus of energy and efficiency. And you know, we heard a lot of discussion about the next five years, 10 years. A lot of people in my field feel like connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, this is a very... 2045 George Jetson kind of thing. That is not true. It is not true. There are connected vehicles out there today. There are autonomous vehicles that are ready to go uh, in, in now. Uh, NHTSA just ruled that the Google driver is considered to be an actual driver. And so, to me, uh, you know, if you if you remember the uh, this is my 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 two and a half year old daughter and my six month old daughter, and I put that um, picture up there one through shameless identification with the audience, right? I generally get a, aw, right? Yeah, he can produce a good-looking offspring despite his natural challenges. And two, uh, you know, my dad, I always used to want to, you know, when I turned 16, so I turned 40 this year, big milestone for me. When I turned 16, I wanted a car because I wanted to drive to school, right? Because that was the symbol of freedom. Having a car was the symbol of freedom. I remember my dad used to tell me, you know, back in my day, I had to walk uphill, to school both ways, right? My parents didn't have enough money to give me a car, and that was the big fight. I am certain that when I, when my daughters turn 16, you know, I'm going to be the old codger who's going to be like, you know, back in my day, we had to drive our cars ourselves. You know, we didn't have these self-driving cars. You know, we 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 had to get out there. And there is a huge implica implication uh, from an energy perspective, from a land design, urban design. You know, like. Uh, the new vision of mobility is around you don't own a car, right? You subscribe to a mobility service. So it's like the Uberization of transportation so that instead of owning a car that sits in your driveway 96% of the time and is a depreciating asset, right? You just subscribe to this service and you get in your car and you uh, or get in a car that pulls up, drops you off at the restaurant that you and your wife or you and your husband want to go to. You don't have to park that car. Right? So you don't need these huge parking structures or huge vast tracts of land uh, set up for, uh, for parking, uh, which means that that land can be developed in cities. Uh, there, are huge, there are big differences now around um, battery storage. I don't know if any of you have heard of using cars which are parked 96% of the time as uh, battery storage for the grid. Right? So you plug it into the grid, and then you know, they get, uh, you know, during peak time, you can draw down off of that. Uh, so I'm really excited. And 
I am getting down to a couple of minutes left. And so I would, I would just say that from a, um, you know, from a, we, we hear this term a lot, disruptions, right? Disruption, the next big disruption. I used to work in D.C. The big term there was game change, right? Game change. That got overused. Uh, before that, it was thinking outside of the box. But the next big disruption in my world, which is uh, transportation, is this self-driving, connected vehicle, autonomous vehicle. It's happening now, and there are huge implications, uh, I, I believe. Not necessarily so huge, but the big implications and, and a real connectivity with the energy sector because a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions come from uh, the transportation sector, and huge amounts of energy uh, are, being, uh, uh, are being used in this area. And if we don't have traffic congestion because all of these cars are being uh, controlled by uh, you know, these, these computers that can keep them off the bumper of the one in front of them, and we don't have as much gridlock as we do now, that frees up a lot of time, space, uh, and energy. So we're working with a lot of diverse partners. We're working with uh, car companies who want to take the technology and put it in their cars. We're working with technology companies who want to take four wheels and put it on their technology, and that is going to be the big battle uh, that we find ourselves in. As we move forward, there's a lot of uh, private sector participation, public sector. One of the folks we're working with in Colorado is the National Renewable Energy Lab. I think it's NREL, uh, because they see huge uh, uh, areas in this. So um, I know it's not... Um, you know, the same as some of the other discussions that you've been having, but I wanted to come down and just talk about this, uh, this area of transportation and energy and how they go forward. And I will stop there and see if anybody has any questions. And I can't really see you, so. Yes, waving the cell phone at me. Thank you. Ah. Just a light, uh, mm -hmm. like a lighter thing. So uh, you talked about the, the traffic at 23X uh, and the idling cars. Uh, the lower house, Parliament in Holland today passed a law, uh, not fully approved, but uh, put through a, a uh, new, new law that suggests that they're going to outlaw the sale of anything but zero emission electric cars by the year 2025. Uh, when is Colorado outlawing uh, the sale of gasoline powered cars? Uh, you know, it is, uh, um, you know, I was told that Austin, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, I've been told that Austin is a blueberry in a big bowl of red tomato soup uh, here in Texas. Uh, uh, yeah, a cherry, right? Cherry pie, that's right. The one blueberry and cherry pie, that's a much better analogy. So Colorado, uh, when I'm in Boulder, I talk uh, a lot about climate change. Uh, and when I'm in uh, uh, other parts of Colorado, I talk about that which may or may not yet be proven, and we're not actually going to call it anything, uh, because there is a diverse, uh, you know, opinions on things. So I don't think you're going to see uh, the banning of the sale of, um, you know, carbon-based vehicles, uh, mostly because, you know, if you are, and, and forgive me, and this is not in my world, so I don't want to offend anybody here, but if you're, if you have a coal, if, if you have an old coal-fired uh, power plant and you lose a bunch of that electricity in transmission, and now I'm going to change the, uh, to an electric vehicle, I'm really just changing the point source of emission there, right? I could burn gas here, or I'm burning coal over here. I know that's changing as, as time goes on. Um, the other thing you're seeing is the CAFE standards have been increased. I think uh, it's 55 miles per gallon is the next target in 2025. And so I remember my first car was a 1991 Jeep, and it got like 10 miles to the gallon uh, going downhill, right? Uh, my, my current car gets 40 miles to the gallon. There are cars out there that, that don't burn any gas whatsoever. So I don't think it'll be a government banning, you know, uh, uh, these vehicles. I think that you're going to see a phase out because, um, it, you know, the, the, the driving mobility model is going to change so that people aren't going to be buying these cars. Sir, and then sir. Hi. Uh, so uh, Tesla has introduced the self-driving cars to, to the cars out there. They just push the firmware and the cars can drive themselves. But that's being done only on private property. Mm -hmm. What's needed on the legislative side for this to be allowed on the public streets? You know, you know, I ask this to private sector companies all the time. What do you need from us uh, as the public sector to help make this happen? They're like, get the hell out of our way, right? Um, but uh, this is, a, this is a big challenge. 
California, their Department of Motor Vehicles actually just pulled back uh, in a big way around letting these uh, companies get out there. Look, this is going to be a controversy until the first person dies in a vehicle that was self-driving, right? Uh, because that's what everybody's afraid of, right? Um, I'll tell you, we lost 33,000 Americans last year. It's not like we're in a vacuum of, uh, of safe driving and everybody's happy. Uh, so I think that what, you, what, what you're going to see is a progression uh, and, a, and, a, and a people pushing the envelope um, and government having to play catch up. Sir, with last, the beard. Last question, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there's, there's kind of three legs on the stool of auto drive cars, uh, you know, car to car communication, car to environment, and car to infrastructure. What idea do you have for the private sector, what you need to be putting on infrastructure that might be a 50 year bridge or a 12 year piece of concrete or a five year piece of asphalt for that part to uh, be functional? Yeah, so there's V to V, vehicle to vehicle, and then V to I. Right, which is vehicle infrastructure. You know, the most important thing that manufacturers have been asking us for is striping, right? Sure. So it's not that expensive relative to like a 50-year bridge, but striping so that these sensors uh, can see where they are. But, you know, even that is going to get outpaced in the next couple of years because these, uh, uh, these GIS sensors with satellite and everything, these vehicles are going to know exactly where they are at all times. I would say that one big issue from our perspective is, uh, f with your industry, is that, that you can't afford to have any downtime, right? Like the system can't be down if, if a bunch of power lines come down because we just had a blizzard in Colorado. The, the system has to stay alive because what happens if my daughter, who has never driven a car, is in a self-driving vehicle and all of a sudden the thing just pulls over to the side of the road because the system's down, right, other than call me, right? What is, she, what is she going to do? And that is, a, that is a big thing because a lot of companies are now like, let's take the steering wheels. Google is like, no steering wheel, no pedals, right? Like, it's just a pod that you sit in. And the question then becomes, how much, how quickly do we make the, uh, make the changeover? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot there. One question. Uh, at South by Southwest Interactive, uh, the founder of Bolt Motorbikes, Mick Jagger has one, Matt Lauer has one, everything. Uh, the, he was saying that the analysts in San Francisco, some of them project that electric vehicles, not only four-wheel, but electric vehicles at large will surpass sales totals for gas fuel vehicles by 2040 to 2050. Do you agree with that? Uh, maybe. You know, it is, it, is, it is entirely... Too speculative, too much, too many I, 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 I just barriers, think, too many... I just think that in 1990 it was somewhat easy to project out to 2010. Mm. I, I'm not saying it's easy, but especially with hindsight now, right? I should have known about Yahoo or Google <laughs> or any of these things. But I just feel like the, what is it, Moore's Law? You know, that the technology yeah. advances, you know, in 18 months or the number of transistors uh, on a, on a uh, whatever you call it. Where's Andres? <laughs> you know, but it, it, it goes, I, it is so hard for me to even project out Five years from now, for your daughter, ten like, years. Yeah. I, you know, that what's she going to drive? Do you think? Do you think she'll have an autonomous vehicle, or will she ride a bike, uh, or a scooter, or? Yeah. Uh, well, we're trying a I'm, hydroplane. We're, we're trying to get her on a stride bike right now. We put yes. her on something with like training wheels. But I'll tell you this: How many of you thought that um, packages would ever be delivered by drones? Right. That that a drone would come and drop off your vehicle. Right. Or did you think it twenty years ago? Right. Or did you think it even five years ago? Uh, and, and so there is huge disruptions coming, big changes are coming, and, and it is going to be a very exciting time in our industry. Shailen, thank you so much for your time. Really thank appreciate you. it. America's most innovative state transportation director. Really appreciate it. Thank you.